Now, I remember something that happened quite often as a kid. And it happened in a lot of different situations. It could be, you know, we're out in the backyard playing 500 with a football. It can be playing uh, baseball with neighborhood kids. It could be when we were playing video games. It could even be in the classroom sometimes. Something wouldn't go quite right. Maybe there'd be a wrong direction, a wrong turn, a wrong move. Everything would kind of melt down, but then somebody would yell out, do over, and you got to start over, and it was the greatest thing. Now, especially with video games, because I was the worst person out of my friend group in playing video games, because my parents didn't let me have video games in our house. And so I'd start to play Super Mario Brothers, and it would not go well, and then I could say, do over, hit reset, and I got to start over. Now, have you ever had a time in your life when you wish you could just yell, do over? Do you ever wish that there was a reset button where you could go back and you could try again? You could have a clean slate. You know, maybe you made a bad choice. Maybe you didn't complete a project on time that you were supposed to. Maybe you said something that you really regret to your spouse. Maybe you spent money on something that turned out to be completely dumb and worthless and you'd give anything to get a do-over, to get a second chance. Well, last week, we looked at the first half of Ephesians chapter 4. And in verse 1, Paul tells us very specifically, he says, lead a life worthy of your calling. All right, that's a pretty tall order. He says, Lead a life worthy of your calling from God. Basically, he's saying live up to who you are in God's family. Live up to who you are in your identity. Because of all the grace and all the love and all the mercy that we've been shown through Jesus, we have great expectations and we also have great potential. Lead a life worthy of your calling. But the reality is, I think if we're all honest, we would say we fall way short of this every single day. I mean, lead a life worthy of our calling. I mean, I'm pretty sure I messed that up on the drive here, right? There are words that we say or there's words that we don't say. There's things that we do and then there's things that we don't do. And I really, really wish that I could get a do-over. Now, if you've ever felt that way before, or if you're feeling that way right now, there is good news for you. You see, the Bible isn't just about self-help. You know, have you ever been to a big bookstore and there's the massive section of self-help books, like seven steps to getting everything right in your life? The Bible's not just a big self-help book. It's actually about finding real hope. It's not about shaming and guilting us into feeling bad and then trying harder just to fail again. It's really about God creating something new in us. You know, if it's all up to our own strength and effort, we're all destined to fail. But remember, just a few weeks ago, we heard that God wants to do more than we could ever ask or imagine. God wants to do even greater things than we could ever ask or imagine. Instead of changing under our own power, with our own will, the gospel is about God's power at work. The gospel is about us becoming who we really are, who we already are in Jesus. You see, God doesn't just make good people better. What he actually does is he makes dead people alive. And we don't earn this. We don't deserve this. We don't bring our resume to somehow impress God because Jesus paid the penalty for all of our sins in full once and for all. He took all the initiative. He took care of our condition 100%. And it's through Jesus that God raises us from death to life. 
So as we look at the second half of Ephesians chapter four today, I want you to remember those core things about how God is working in power, how he is intent on raising each one of us from death to life. Because as we open this section together, at first glance, it can look like just a bunch of do's and don'ts. It can look like a very intimidating list of rules that we have to somehow figure out how to follow. But you see, this isn't meant to just be a rule book prescribing the changes we need to make in our life. Instead of being a prescription, it is a description of the change that God wants to bring about in our life through the power of the Spirit. So I want to invite you to grab your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. There's Bibles in front of you in the pews, or you can grab your phone, use the YouVersion app. However you like to engage with the Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And a reminder, it's in the New Testament, past the Gospels. It's in the section of Paul's letters, and the little acronym I like to use is God's Electric Power Company. So Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, God's Electric Power Company. Galatians, or sorry, Ephesians chapter 4. Now, if you've been with us during the series, you'll remember that as we went through chapters one through three, there was this common refrain that Paul kept using, or he kept pointing us towards. He kept wanting us to remember who we are. You know, you might have troubles in your life, you might have questions about life, you might have struggles day to day, but remember who you are. It makes all the difference in the world. Remember who you are. Paul says, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. He says, you have been adopted into God's family through Jesus. He says, by grace you have been saved through faith, not by works, so that no one can boast. Remember who you are. And he says, you are redeemed. You have been chosen. You have been adopted. You have been raised up. You are God's workmanship, created to do good works. For others. And you're called to keep on growing up. That's what we talked about last week. We're called to keep on growing up in unity and diversity and maturity. Now, it's significant that Paul spent three whole chapters simply describing who we are. There's nothing about doing anything. It's just this ongoing reminder because it is so impactful when we remember who we are in Jesus. But now he's going to go on to say, now live like it. Walk in that truth. Remember who you are. That's the power of the gospel. So the natural question becomes, well, what does this all look like in our everyday life? How do we actually live up to our calling? We all know that we fall short of that so often. So what is God getting at? What are we supposed to take away from Paul's letter? Well, let's start with verse 17 of Ephesians chapter 4. Paul says, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Now let's stop there for a moment because just that sentence can be awfully confusing. Because earlier Paul talked about both the Jews and the Gentiles and how we are to be one, how we are to be united together in God's family. There should be this unity, this peace between us. So why is he calling out the Gentiles right here? Well, we need to understand that he's referring to the Old Testament where there is a separation between the people of Israel and then everyone else in the world who are called the Gentiles. God chose to begin his saving work and his saving plan through the people of Israel. Not because they were any better than anyone else, but that is where he started and wanted to bless the rest of the world through. At that point, the people of Israel were within God's saving plan and everyone else was on the outside. 
And so here what Paul is saying is he's talking about anyone outside of God's saving plan. Basically, he's saying, don't live like people who live apart from God's standards. Don't live like people who decide to live outside of God's grace and God's plan for them. He goes on to explain what this looks like in verses 18 and 19. He says, their minds are full of darkness. They wander far, far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. Now, among other things, what Paul is really getting at here is, a, is how many people live a self-centered existence. Many people are completely focused on themselves. Whatever feels good, whatever makes them happy, they do it. There's no concern with how it affects other people. All that matters is oneself. There's no moral standards. It's just whatever feels good. Really, what Paul is doing here is describing the most basic problem of sin, which is self-centeredness. It's being turned inward. And every one of us here knows what this is about because every single one of us here struggles with this, with self-centeredness, self-interest, being turned inward away from others. And so most importantly, as we dig into this section, what Paul wants us to remember, what he wants us to understand, what he wants us to never forget is that if you put your faith in Jesus, this is not how you are supposed to live. When you're connected to Jesus, when you're a part of his family, you're called to walk differently. You're called to a higher standard, a higher lifestyle. Look at verses 20 and 21. He says, but that isn't what you learned about Christ, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him. He's simply telling the story of our faith. First, you hear about Jesus, then you put your faith in him, and then you're taught the truth that is in him and from him. Now, when we're connected to Christ, it should fundamentally change who we are. It changes our values and our outlook and our standards. Our identity is completely made new. We're adopted into God's family. We become heirs of everything he has. We truly become a new creation which gives us new motivation, new inspiration, new power for living. So verse 22 then goes on to tell us what to do now. Paul says, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. You see, really what Paul says here is what each one of us needs to do, what we need to remember, is to change our clothes. Now let's stop here for a moment, just pause, because this might sound really weird, especially if you're not connected to church or maybe you've never read Paul's letters before. There are numerous times that Paul talks about being clothed with Christ. And if you get super literal about it or you try to picture how this works, it can bring up some kind of weird images and questions. But really what Paul is doing here is he's trying to take something very relatable, something that we all do, so that we can identify with it and understand it. You see, I think we all know what it's like to be working out in the yard on a hot summer day. Maybe you're mowing the lawn or maybe it's later in the summer and you start to rake the yard or maybe you're gardening and you get all sweaty and dirty and finally you clean everything up and you go in the house, you take a shower and you put on some clean clothes, right? I mean, you can probably feel right now how good that feels. What Paul is telling us 
is that we need to take off our old self, the way we used to live before Christ. When we're self-centered, we're self-interested, we're turned inward. Because that's not who we're meant to be. That's not how we were created to live. Paul is saying, change your clothes. Then in verse 23, he goes on to say, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Take off your old self, your old way of living, and then start to be renewed. So what does renewal actually look like? Well, he said it starts first with our attitudes and our thoughts. And when you think about it, so much of how our day goes, so much of how our relationships go, so much of how we approach life is dependent on our thoughts and our attitudes. I mean, we've all probably tried a new, to instill a new habit before or maybe to start a new hobby or a new activity. And you can go out and buy all the equipment. You can get all the name brand gear that you want. But if you don't change your thoughts and your attitudes, it's not going to make much of a difference. You're not going to get into that new habit or master that new activity or hobby. It starts with our thoughts and our attitudes. To be made new is not something we can do on our own, and that's why Paul says it comes through the power of the Spirit. That change that we all need in our life comes through the power of God. It's not through our own effort and will. It's through surrendering to God, letting him be in control. Well, then Paul says in verse 24, put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Now stop and let that sink in for a moment because what Paul is saying is that we were created to be like God. God. But notice he doesn't say you were created to be a God. You're created to be like God. And God is righteous and he's holy. And there is one true God. Change your clothes. Put on your new self. Now in our world today, clothes go out of style very quickly, don't they? And there might have been a time in your life when you really cared about being in style, and some of you might say, well, I can't even remember back then. Whether or not you care about being in style, for many people, it's a big concern. I remember back as a, a teenager, all the different styles that we went through in the late 80s. You know, at one point, tight rolling jeans, and then pinning jeans, and popping collars, and then having really baggy jeans, which was very embarrassing. The thing is, when we stay with our old self, when we don't take off that old self as Paul's encouraged us to do, when we stay centered on ourself, when we're driven by sin, it goes out of style very quickly because it's that self-centeredness, it's that old self that impacts our relationships, our attitude, our outlook, our potential in so many negative ways. But it's our new nature, centered in Christ and his character, that never, ever goes out of style. Because this is who we were created to be. And this is how we were created to live. And this is how we reach our fullest potential. So Paul uses this imagery numerous times throughout his letters in Galatians and Colossians and Corinthians, this idea of putting on Christ. And again, it's because it's something we do daily. We, we clothe ourselves daily. It's relatable for every person. But Paul also wants us to remember that this is a daily routine that we need to embrace Keep on throwing off your old ways of living and put on your new nature in Christ. You may have had a very disappointing day yesterday. You might have said something or done something you wish you could go back and do over. 
But what Paul is saying is take off the old, put on the new, get back in the game. You do have an opportunity for a do-over. So Paul goes on then to give us a clear picture of what this actually looks like. Look at verse 25. He first says, so stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. He's saying in all of our relationships, put on your new self. And part of that means stop telling lies. Now that might mean outright untruths. It might mean just little white lies. It also might mean pretending to be someone you're not. I mean, maybe you go out of your way to try to make yourself look good or like you have it all together. Paul says we need to take that off and instead to put on truthfulness to set aside the many ways that we lie to each other. And he says, we need to remember, we're on the same team. We're part of the same body. And that means we need to look out for each other. Well, then in verses 26 and 27, he says, and don't, let, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Now, anger is a normal human emotion. Every one of us has been angry with someone or something. And here it's important to know Paul isn't saying anger is automatically sinful. It's okay to be angry about injustice or mistreatment or racism or abuse. And the list goes on and on. But he's also saying we have to be careful because anger is an easy way to fall back into our old ways. Anger can hijack our thinking and our attitudes. It can cause us to act out of fear and out of revenge and to be callous and to be cruel towards others. Paul tells us that this is so important that we shouldn't let the sun go down while we're still angry. It's because it's when we become the most vulnerable. Anger has the potential to take your heart and your mind And it can take away your hope and your joy. And so this is great advice for every marriage, for every friendship, for every family. It reminds me of a story I heard about a couple who were newly married and they had a big argument. And so they decided to have the silent treatment towards each other. And they didn't talk for like a week. Well, the husband had a business trip the next day and he knew he needed his wife's help because he often slept through his alarm. So he wrote down on a note, he said, please wake me up at 5 a.m. So they went to sleep, and the next morning he woke up and he looked at the clock, and it was 9 a.m. So he went over and and was about to just get mad at his wife when he found a note next to him that said, wake up, it's 5 (laughs) a.m. You're a new creation. You are in Christ. There is no need to hang on to anger any longer. Make a regular daily routine of putting aside your old self and putting on your new self. Part of that is setting aside anger and grudges and revenge, and it means prioritizing forgiveness. Forgiving others, receiving forgiveness from others, give others the benefit of the doubt, believe the best about people, and leave all the judgment and the payback up to God. He's gonna figure it out in the very best way. Look at verse 28. Paul says, if you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good, hard work, and then give generously to others in need. It's the old self that steals. It takes what isn't ours. It cheats cuts corners, takes the easy way out. Have you ever been tempted to cheat at school? How about on your taxes? It's easy for us to try to justify it and find reasons to do it. The old self is all about trying to get ahead at any cost. But the new self, Paul says, is focused on helping others. He says, work hard, but not to just advance yourself so you can climb the ladder. Work hard so that you can give generously to other people. You see, the focus isn't on me, it's on we. 
The community is more important than the individual. When we throw off our old self and put on the new, it impacts every part of our life. Work, school, home, neighborhood, community. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Verse 29, Paul says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Taking off the old self means changing the way you talk. No more gossip. No more tearing people down. Have you ever been in a group of people before where they start to talk about someone behind their back? probably in a negative way, and it makes you very uncomfortable. You don't want to be a part of it, but then you find yourself going along with it and even participating in it. That's the old self. Now, churches can often be the worst at this. Oftentimes, one of the places that we gossip the most is in corporate prayers. Have you ever noticed that before? I'm going to pray for this person, but also way overshare about them. Putting on the new self means being careful how we speak about others. The new self is focused on building people up, encouraging them, lifting them up. Well, then look at verse 30. Paul says, And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption don't grieve the Holy Spirit. You see, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. You have been called by the Holy Spirit. He gives you the promise of God's love and grace. And what grieves the Holy Spirit most is when we put on our old clothes again. When we go back into our old habits and ways. And finally, in verse 31, Paul says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. When we put on our new clothes, we have no need to hang on to grudges, to hang on to hurts. We're freed up to show grace and kindness to others, even those people who have hurt us deeply. Well, after all of these things, after describing the old and the new, Paul finishes up by reminding us where we can find our motivation and our inspiration for changing our clothes. He says, instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. And here's the key. Just as God through Christ has forgiven you. If you need motivation, if you need inspiration for treating other people well, the best place to start is to remember what God has done for you. We can learn to be genuinely kind and compassionate and forgiving by simply remembering how God has treated us in that exact way same way. How God has forgiven us of all of our sins because of what Jesus has done. We can take our cues from how gracious and loving and merciful God has been to us. When someone wrongs us, we can choose to model how God has treated us. Well, then in chapter 5, just the first two verses, Paul says, imitate God. Therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Follow God's example and live a life filled with with love. Now, if we're truly imitating God, we have to focus on what Jesus did for us on the cross. 
He loved us and offered himself for us as a sacrifice. And you know, that's the kind of love that we're called to show others. Even those people who get under our skin, even those people who cheer for a different team than we do, even those people who are sitting on the other side of the aisle from us politically, we're called to have the same kind of love that Jesus has for us. So church, what are you wearing today? Don't forget to change your clothes. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your amazing grace and love. How you don't want us to stay the way we are, but you want us to realize our full potential in you. So God, help us every day to have a daily routine of throwing aside our old self, our old clothes, and instead putting on our new clothes, our new identity, our new nature in you. God, help us day after day to become more and more like Jesus. God, help us to consider the words that we speak and the actions that we do and how we treat people. Help us to put all those things through the filter of your love and your grace and your forgiveness. God, help every person we meet out in the community, everywhere we go, to experience your everlasting love radiating from us. Help them to see you through how we interact, how we talk, how we relate to people. God, we're gonna fall flat on our face. We're gonna be failures if we do this alone. So we ask that your Holy Spirit comes and fills us up, gives us the motivation, the inspiration, and gives us the power to do what you're calling us to do. God, with you, all things are possible. And so we trust you, and we love you, and we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen.